No time to be meek The goal is to seek The next big thing Hello everybody, it is Friday, April the 5th, 2024, another week in tech, hasn't been a good week for my own particular football team, they drew one all at West Ham United in East London, of course West Ham famous for their bubbles, uh, but the bubble wasn't a bubble for Tottenham at least when they went there this week, and a bubble isn't a bubble for Keith either. Keith Tier, the author of That Was The Week, uh, his newsletter. I don't think he was watching the Spurs game. He's probably watching something else. Uh, but the title of his newsletter this week is When Is A Bubble Not A Bubble? And Keith is joining us not from East London, but from Palo Alto, just down the peninsula from me. Keith, um, when is a bubble not a bubble? Um, well... A bubble is not a bubble when you disagree with the people who say it is. Let's say, let's put it that way. Um, uh, a bubble is in the eye of the beholder, uh, shall we say? What I what I talk about in my editorial this week is that bubble has become a politicized word. That is to say, uh, for people who um, are pretty much skeptics on technology and innovation, whenever money is attracted to something new in Silicon Valley, the word bubble arises pretty much in the first day, definitely by the first week. And it lasts for several years until um, inevitably there's some correction in the market and then the bubble has burst. And that narrative is basically a false narrative. And I bet it is Lena Khan behind at the bubble. Lena Khan has nothing to do with the bubble. Uh, new new listeners will not get the joke, but we talk about Lena Khan. Keith a has lot. a particular love hate <laughs> relationship, more hate with Lena Khan than love. So, even though you, Keith, you've acknowledged that, I mean, even if you're not a tech skeptic, sometimes the bubble is for real. I mean, there is some general frothiness about the AI economy, isn't there? Could, would you acknowledge that? Well, I, I think if you if you put it into normal language and say that large amounts of money are being attracted very early to a promising future technology and that the money being attracted is a lot larger than would be justified by the current value of these things, then yes, that would be true. But that, to me, is normal and rational behavior. It's, it, it's people betting on the outcome earlier than the outcome is uh, you know, for certain. Uh, and, and I think in technology, that almost always benefits the people making the bets. So it, so bubble implies they're doing something irrational. Um, I don't think they are. I think they're being super rational. Well, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Usually we end on the X of the week, but let's begin there because your X of the week, um, is an anti-bubble post by Mike Maples, who was at the Y Combinator event uh, this week with Gary Tan and the Y Combinator team. <clears throat> and uh, Maples was really blown away with all the, the AI there. Um, so, so maybe talk about that. Were you there, Keith? It looks as if there was a lot of interesting stuff going on. There was this car outside that I actually saw in San Francisco. I don't know who makes this car, but it, <laughs> it's visually astonishing. When I saw it, I almost crashed my own car. And then, of course, there's the obligatory dog-like robots and uh, lots of uh, sunlit rooms where excited entrepreneurs sat and contributed to the bubble. Uh, what, what happened at the Y Combinator event that's so important? Um, that, that that so impressed Mike Maple? Well, firstly, uh, standard practice is that something like 250 companies are chosen by Y Combinator to go through a training experience where they improve you know, their story and uh, often their business over about a three-month period. And they have a demo day at the end of it. So last week was the demo day. Of the 264, a very large number were AI companies. That is a Tesla car, by the way, just in case you're 
Not is, it a, is it a Tesla you can buy or is it a prototype? No, you can buy it. It's uh, That's the finished look. It can, it's meant to compete with the Ford F-150. Mm. Well, anyway, that was there and there were all the uh, the robots. I mean, there, that robot looks as if it could have existed 10 years ago. I don't know what was so revolutionary about that one. Probably um, mechanically it could have, but I bet you the software makes it do things it couldn't have done 10 years ago now. I mean, um, but, but anyway, the short story is Maple was impressed by the quality of the founders and their focus. And Mike is um, a principal at Floodgate Ventures. He makes investments, early stage investments. Yeah, and he wrote, I could sense greatness in every direction that I look. So Mike Maple certainly uh, doesn't believe in the bubble, although the VCs wouldn't, would they? Well, they don't. You see, a bubble is good. Um, that's, the, that's, that's what people don't understand. A bubble is good. It means that money is being attracted to innovation. Imagine if there was no bubble. It would imply that there's no opportunity. Yeah, and that's the analysis of a lot of tech historians. Um, uh, Carlotta Perez, I think, suggests that uh, bubbles are essential in order to create the infrastructure for, for, for real innovation. So what happened um, in AI this week, Keith, in terms of making sense of what one of your your pieces was called uh, by Ed uh, Zitron was called Bubble Trouble. Yeah. Well, he he's focused on a technicality. Um, it's interesting to use the word bubble trouble, but I, I think his, more, his real message is AI may be in trouble. And, and his argument is that uh, lack of data to train the AI on, um, meaning that at some point, 100% of all the available data to train on will have been used. And at that point, how will the AI get cleverer? I think Which is that, a good point. And of course, you, you didn't cite some of these pieces, but there's ongoing uh, issues in the law courts between creatives and these new AI platforms about whether they should or shouldn't have the right to their creativity, to their art, to their music, to their writing. So um, the content or the the, the stuff that Zitron's so worried about may dry up even before they've come to the end of it. I, I don't think there's a concept of it drying up. I actually think he's making a mistake. Um, the, AI doesn't work like that. It doesn't need an endless stream of new data. It needs to have enough data to become clever. And once it becomes clever, it can pass data that it's never seen before. For example, I, I, I put code into ChatGPT that it's never seen before, but it's clever enough based on its learning to be able to edit my code and make it better. So I, I don't think AI requires an unlimited amount of data. So Once you're, you're a, uh, an unrestrained optimist, Keith. There's nothing about this AI craze that worries you at all? I didn't call it a bubble. I, I, I would say all science, all science contains um, the limits of its current knowledge. So, you know, if you look at the history of medical science, of, of air travel, uh, at any given moment, the science uh, contains within itself the limits of the science. Yeah, but that wasn't the question. I mean, last week so, we so, had a, so, a story well, no, about... No, the, um, so the answer is, of course, everyone should be worried, but the answer to being worried is more science, not less science. What about the... You, neither you or I are scientists. We're more interested in the market and startup opportunities. Last week we had the story of Suleiman, uh, Mustafa Suleiman and Reid Hoffman's startup that essentially they they gave away to Microsoft. Clearly, they couldn't raise the money. Um, you you mention I don't know if it's you or, or perhaps one of the pieces that um, the only real manifestation of, of, of bubble investment was Amazon's four billion dollar investment in uh, uh, what is it Anthrop uh, Anthropic Anthropic. So, I mean, in the actual marketplace, is there a bubble? Is are, are people bidding? 
um, irrationally, uh, what one famous economist would call irrational exuberance that I think he coined in the late 90s to define the, the dot-com insanity, in which was a bubble, whatever you say. Well, a, a, a bubble is only a bubble at the end. Uh, up until the end. Um, <laughs> What's it uh, before? Uh, a be, little bubble. Be, no. A big bubble. Bef before it's, uh, and by the way, it's always rational in my view. There is no such thing as irrational exuberance except for the people who come too late and overpay um, just before um, prices are reset. And, and and if you understand, you know, how, how long uh, long cycles work, this is a, a repetitive... Yeah, I know, but let, let's use the late 90s as an example. One of your companies experienced the bubble fate, certainly more than one of mine. Um, in the late 90s, there were many companies, the vast majority didn't survive. So is, is that, that the case? So, so, let me just, because yeah, this but, is an important question in terms of this AI economy. Of the, of, of 100 AI startups, how many of them will, in your view, still be around in five years? It'll be shocking if the answer is more than 10%. So you're a bubble guy, Keith. No, I'm, I, I think that's, a, that's entirely rational because the 10% that survive will make a lot more than 100% of the money invested. But that's not the, that wasn't the question I asked. So let, let's well, go back then to then the 90s. Bubble. If, if we it's were talking not. in 1997, 1998, it may only be one in 100 that would have survived in 2001. Is it, is, are we not going to have what economists would call the correction in the AI economy? Yeah, but you see, the narrative is being framed as a pejorative, as if there's something wrong. The truth is, massive amounts of value are being created. It's not destroyed. Value isn't being destroyed. It's being created. And a bubble, well, but, 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 a bubble implies the opposite. So bubble is... You're the, reading bubble, stuff wait, into me, that. All they're doing is... Let me finish as well. A bubble is an ignorant word spoken by someone that doesn't understand economics. I'm not sure that's true. Let's go back to the 90s. There were a lot of Me Too dog food online stores, and they none of them survived. Maybe one of them survived. No, so you're, that was you're a making, bubble in, you're, in, you're, in dot com. You're, you're kind of making things up, Andrew. There was one of those. Uh, There's only one everyone can remember. Was it called dogfood.com? Uh, yeah, but there was lots that made it. Like I use, um, I, I'm blanking on its name now, but I get food for my dog from um the the pet place that's uh that was started way back and it's massive and profitable just like uh you know the shoe play the shoe but, um, but i don't think i think you're miss again you're misreading what the bubble people would say they're, they're not claiming I, any I sort of moral so. oh, hold on they're not claiming any moral observation they're simply saying that of the 10 companies in or the of the hundred companies in AI today, only five or ten of them are going to survive. Most of them will go away, and there'll be a a climax or an anti climax where they where where the money runs out. And that's always the case. But there's no moral observation here. No, it's the the, the impl reality. The implication, Andrew, is that things are being overpriced. Now, whether if if you want to really mathematically determine whether things are being overpriced. You have to measure the price from the amount of value that will be produced from the investments. And the amount of value that will be produced from these investments is you know, many, many, many times more than the investments. So even if 90% of these companies fail, it isn't a bubble from, from the point of view of the people writing the checks. It's an investment. And it's a good investment, probably. Yeah, They're not I knew there was some signal rank ideology here. You're just trying to get people to, to invest in startups. I think we, we both know the truth about this. Well, any, any individual startup, Andrew, is a risk. So if, if you were to ask me, you know, is that investment in that company indicative of a bubble? I might say yes. But... Good investors don't only invest in one company. Venture capital is... Right, but I think the point of bubbles is that you're right, of course, about good investors, 
people like Mike Maple who probably see these the best deals before everyone else. But the point about bubbles is it brings everyone in. So it's it's not just the good investors, it's the bad investors. So it's the the old story of the the cab drive. Everybody in the late 90s knew that it was whether you want to call it a bubble or a craze or irrational exuberance when cab drivers in New York or San Francisco started to talk to you about the value of Yahoo stock. Um, yeah, so, but, so bubble, whatever you want to call it, exuberance or excitement, it attracts less professional investors. There's more money, there's more froth, and there are more casualties, startup casualties, investor casualties. In, no, if you look at the venture capital section of this week's newsletter, you would conclude that the opposite is happening, that there's a shrinking amount of money going into venture capital. The, the, the large numbers in AI are almost entirely driven by Amazon's investment. So, in yeah. So actually, individual investors are not piling in. Um, and venture capital as a whole has got less money than it's had for many years. Uh, the, all the graphs are down in terms of amount raised and number of rounds. Um, the average per round is flat to up at the early stage, but down at the late stage. Right. And this comes in, we've talked about this before, and you had another interesting piece from TechCrunch about big tech companies forming a new consortium to allay fears of AI job takeovers. One of the things I've observed, uh, and I, 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 you haven't pushed back on this one, I think, is that... Um, it's much less of a kind of crazy startup environment in the tw in 20 uh, mid 2020s than it was in the mid 1990s because you can't just start a company with a credit card and a couple of guys uh, now you need you may not need the kind of billions of dollars that are anthropic require uh, but you still got to have significant resources so it lends itself less to um to startups and oddly enough it's the big tech companies the googles the microsofts the amazons and the apples of the world that are both big tech companies and also doing the starting up is that right it, it's right but there's a equally impressive counter trend um, the counter trend is that because of ai it's now possible for individuals to create companies without software or hardware and the one of the memes in the valley is that in the next decade we're going to see the first uh, billion dollar companies that have a single employee the founder um so and and, and actually rex woodbury's piece this week about uh, weapons of mass production production <laughs> uh can't kind of relate to that but what would that mean i mean how can you have a company without hardware or software is it just basically tim ferris or no, because you use AI to build software, so you don't need engineers. Uh, and and the software is hosted uh, in the cloud uh, almost for free. Uh, like my my bill at Snowflake for the whole of Signal Rank is about $1,000 a month. Uh, it's not very much in the big picture. So th th So the counter trend is that Productivity, which is really the theme of this week's editorial due to the Economist article about China. Um, productivity is going to get to the point where a single individual can do what used to take a team of 300. Yeah, and that, that, of course, raises the issue, Keith, as you know better than I do about jobs, or what, the weapons of mass production touches on that. And there's another piece that I think you're going to add to the newsletter which is interesting. David Orto is a very distinguished economist at MIT, always been very critical of the impact of AI on, on jobs. But he's actually, and this is a piece from the New York Times this week, he's changed his mind. He thinks that AI might benefit the middle class because it will undermine the kind of monopoly of professional classes, of the engineers and the doctors and the lawyers. So he, whereas most people are rather pessimistic, uh, Auto is actually um, becoming more optimistic, which I assume you share his position. Yeah. Uh, and it would that. fit with the weapons of mass production where we all become entrepreneurial titans. Yeah, I'd, I'd count myself as one of the middle class that he is referring to because I, 
I use AI for coding. One of our listeners, by the way, just put in the chat that they've they've shipped three SaaS products in the last uh, period um, in six months themselves as an individual. Um, and I'm one of those. I, I, I um, uh, uh, um, Tom Landers also says there's a book called uh, Ask You Ask You Developer. Is that right? It doesn't seem right. Uh, How a single person might create a unicorn. Um, so I there is there is a whole discussion around this, and that's because it's quite credible. It's it's real. I'm one of them. Uh, in the last three weeks, I've completely rewritten Signal Rank's algorithms to a new upgraded algorithm that performs even better than the old one. And I did it all by myself. Uh, I, I, I'm, you know, a B level SQL engineer. Uh, and, you know, my team uh, uh, see me doing it. And, and I'm a single handedly building, uh, building an entire ecosystem. What do you need you know, a team for? I mean, that might reverse the argument. What happens to the coders you used to employ? Uh, they work on deep science mostly um, that that is lower down in the stack. Um, uh, you know, I built a website, uh, signalrank.ai, um, uh, using it. It, it. It honestly, you can do a lot, and and I, I know uh, with Keen On and Now TV, Andrew, you're always um, looking for help. You're going to be able to do it yourself. I guarantee. It. Well, I already do, which is why it's such a bad show. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, we're going to have many, many conversations about this. But I was particularly intrigued by the author piece because, uh, as I said, I mean, he's a very credible economist. And he seems to think that it actually might benefit the middle class. Although, on the other hand, what I would be fearful of in this new world, in this weapons of mass production, where you can have companies without hardware and software, is it would compound the winner-take-all economics of the last 25 years but that's another question i know that keith your your thinking on bubbles was actually triggered this week by a piece on china by simon cox the economist uh china economics editor called money talks what is cox saying and what does this have to do with bubbles so Co cox has been covering china a long time and he starts by quoting himself from 2006 um saying that China's mission as a nation is to combine technology to recreate, in quotes, the productive forces uh, and make it possible for productivity to uh, be very, very high. And then he goes on in an article that he wrote for the printed magazine this week to talk about how she, uh, uh, that is the core of Xi's beliefs which by the way is the opposite of the cultural revolution when modernity was frowned upon and tried to be destroyed. So China China now is pro-tech, pro-innovation. Uh, productive forces is a Marxist word that combines human beings and technology into a single thing. Uh, and its focus is to um, develop the division of labor uh, so that less people can do more of what uh, more people used to do before. So uh, Cox is picking that up, and it triggered in me a rec you know a recognition that that pure message of innovation really last existed in Western culture, uh, you know, in the Enlightenment when positivism was the big buzzword, and that today actually the Western nations are super skeptical of technology and don't have that sense of progress that China is talking about. And, and, and it feels to me as if that's going to be a huge impediment to modernizing America, the UK, most of Europe. Uh, and they will get left behind, not because they're incapable, but because they've intellectually persuaded themselves to not like technology. Yeah, I don't know who you've been talking to, but I don't. I mean, there is currently a little bit of pessimism about technology, but I don't see that in America. There's still a lot of massive faith in the potential of technology of green tech of digital well, I, technology I, I, of yeah. ai i mean who are you talking to keith where where is all this pessimism actually i did i did say that uh, silicon valley is the only part of the us that's like china silicon valley does believe in those where things. else have you been what, what what isn't like china what about new york's full of innovation 
Come on, look, Austin, at the, look at the Baltimore Bridge discussion. They they claim it's going to take them more than ten years to rebuild that bridge. That that's not very innovative. Well, that's an infrastructure problem, but that doesn't reflect technological pessimism. It it reflects societal pessimism that that also infects technology. You know, uh, you know, teenagers' mental health crisis is the other one. Uh, everybody's focused on um, problematizing it rather well, than... Some people might be listening to this, Keith, and thinking, what about this obnoxious Yorkshireman? Why doesn't just go and live in China if you love it so much? Go and live in... No, I, no I'm, I'm living in the part of America that is the most like China, which is Silicon Valley. Well, we will see. I have to admit, I don't agree. I think America still is much more innovative than China culturally and in many other senses. One area where there is, and I agree with you here, a great deal of pessimism is on social media. Uh, Jonathan Haidt has been very influential in this. He has a new book out, The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. I don't know if you've had a chance to read the book, Keith, um, but what do you think of Haidt's, um, Haidt's thesis about this connection between anxiety, mental health, and social media. You know, I'm obviously I'm not an expert, but I'm going to tell you my intuition is to completely disagree with it. I, I, I think mental health is, uh, you know, we, back in our day, Andrew, when we were uh, at university, we used to call it alienation. Um, that is to say, uh, a sense of uh, a lack of a sense of purpose and belonging. Uh, and I think the causes of that, and I do think it's real, but I think the causes of that are to do with the real prospects in society. The fact that, you know, my children, the idea they could buy a house is a pipe dream. Um, so the real, the real truth is that anxiety and alienation or uh, a low sense of opportunity is driven by the real world. If anything, social media is a place people go uh, to get away from that, to live in a slightly unreal world where their friends are and they can enjoy themselves. Probably that explains why TikTok's so popular. It's fun. Um, so I, I think of social media as um, the same as I think about going to the movies or a concert. It's a, a place to escape to for young people. And not a place to where they learn to be mentally ill. I think so you're saying that the anxiety, which is a fact, I don't think anyone would disagree with that, the high rates of therapy and mental illness, especially amongst younger people, that that's a reflection of what, a, a digit, late stage digital capitalism or whatever you want to call it, or the nature of our economy? It, it, you know, it's probably too early to fully diagnose it, but I, I'd be shocked if... Uh, COVID didn't have something to do with it. The fact, you know, one of my sons spent two years working from home instead of being in college. Um, he was lucky he got a job because I could make some introductions, but none of his friends have gotten jobs and they have the same degrees as him. I, I think it's it's actually um, a, re a realistic reaction to what's happening. Another interesting piece that you had this week, and a lot of really, it's a great newsletter, Keith. Um, is from one of your favorite writers, Thomas Tong Tongus, a, a, a venture capitalist. Um, on uh, the right, I mean, we've talked endlessly about the attention economy on this show. And books have been written about it. But the increasing decline of attention, do you think, and I don't know what Tongus thinks about this, is there a connection between this anxious generation and their inability to pay attention? Does an inability to pay attention, create more or less anxiety? And, and, and where's the causality here? Is the lack of attention causing anxiety or is the anxiety ca causing the lack of attention? Well, based on my prior answer, I'm going to say neither. Um, what I think what's happening is uh, attention is now a currency. And you're not going to give your attention to something unless it adds something. And people now have an ability to pass information super fast and decide whether to give it more time. Um, I, I just watched um, um, The Three-Body Problem on Netflix. And I didn't read the novel 
it's four novels actually i didn't read any of them before now i now i will because the attention i gave to the show made me realize that i want to read the novels and sometimes i'll see a tweet and i'll click on it and disappear immediately from the page i go to other times i'll spend 30 minutes there so i think what people are doing is they're they're being able to pass and reject much faster they're highly educated to to do that and so i think most of these things are are um are symptoms of intelligence not a not a failure now i do think that deep diving into subject areas that uh our LinkedIn user here just talked about um, is super important. I, I I I spend hours every day deep diving into my work, but I'm not I'm not going to spend a lot of time on a website that doesn't add anything to me. I'm going to pay it less attention. And given that we're using Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, where it's posts, not essays, mostly. Um, I think the ability to leave quickly is a skill everyone has to learn. So I think that reduction in um, in attention span is people deciding to leave quickly. So you're not in the the cultural pessimist uh, community who argue that, and and this debate again has been going on for almost twenty years. Nick Carr was very influential. Our, failure of the attention economy undermining our ability to write books you think it reflects more intelligence rather than less you're in a minority there Keith, but maybe you're right well look look are you being intelligent when you leave a website quickly because there's nothing there for you but that's nothing to do with the attention economy i mean there's always you, you could read a book and you put it down after a couple of pages because you didn't like it or you found it boring um, well, that's got nothing to do with the attention economy. You'd pick up another book. In Thomas's case, I'm going to guess it's a sign of lack of product market fit between his content and the people who show up to the website. Yeah, I think anyone who actually goes to websites these days is archaic. They're probably old, Keith, like you and I, and you had an interesting piece on age. Um, the world is getting older. Global senior population is growing dramatically. Uh, interesting piece on, on this. How does this fit into the narrative about anxiety and attention and the bubble of AI? Is it connected or is it a, a separate uh, theme? here? Well, there's a lot of complicated things buried inside it. Uh, you know, um, an aging population is usually considered a bad thing because the question then arises, who will do the work? But in the era we're living in, there's a, another question, which is, will there be any work? Um, and, and so um, they, those two questions kind of coexist. We also have this immigration debate uh, about how too many people are coming into the country, but at the same time, there isn't enough people to do the jobs. As came out today in the numbers, by the way, the jobs numbers were super high again. So I, I, I put this in because I've long believed that, um, you know, I'm not a Malthusian, uh, so I don't believe that- well, Explain what a, not everyone, Keith, will know what a Malthusian is. Well, I, I don't believe that population size is the main variable in calculating resource allocation. Um, I think productivity is. And, and so um, that what that means is that a shrinking working population is is fine as long as productivity is going up. The earlier conversation implies that that is likely to happen, but I still think the jury should be out on, on that. Tech hasn't always delivered productivity increases. In fact, rarely it does it. Um, so I think the jury is out, but I do think you've got to put population aging, immigration, the decline of jobs, all have to be in the same conversation, which really requires a national vision for the future. And the interesting thing is that's what China, whether you like China or not, and there's obviously a lot wrong with China, but the one thing you can't deny is they have a, they have a national narrative on the future. Uh, the, the, the parody of that is the five-year plan um, that Stalin invented. Uh, but having some kind of a plan is probably a good idea. And I don't think there is one in America. I think all these conversations are politicized short term 
and no one really owns the narrative for the for the near or you know what it's also people. good about china keith yeah lena khan isn't there it's true that's true they're worse than her <laughs> are you uh, if you get a call from uh, the chinese ambassador uh, after this you're gonna accept their passport give up living in palo alto and go and live in beijing i will not be doing that because i love living in america um my my, my critique of america is because i want to live here and i would like it yeah and what's interesting in, in all seriousness about this growth of old people is we already have we've got a, an election coming up in america as everybody knows between two seemingly senile 80 year olds what is this global senior population going to do to the the current gerontocracy in america is it going to make it even more gerontocratic what happens to young people it, it, it will and by the way it also implies by the way andrew that young people are not having families at the same rate that earlier generations did which well, that comes back to the anxiety and the friends of your son who can't get work most people don't get married and don't have kids if they don't have work exactly exactly so that so that to me is is kind of structural and requires you know that that bridge in baltimore should be back up and running in 12 months well maybe uh, you should maybe Biden should call you up and you can run it. What about in terms of the, the size of this older generation? What about resources themselves? Our generation, Keith, you and I are good examples of this. We own expensive real estate, which presumably we will only give up when we die. If we continue to live, how does the how how, how does wealth get redistributed within communities? You know, the, I think that ends up being very personal. I, I can tell you in my case, there's no way I can live in my house until I die unless I come into a large sum of money because most of my net worth is in property. And I think that's true of most people, by the way, that own property. It's a big part of their net worth. And so you end up having to sell and move somewhere cheaper and live off the proceeds. In China, the Keith. I don't, how's the real estate in China? <laughs> it's actually... Uh, correcting right now to lower prices wow well it's all coming into place um finally or actually before finally we're going to come to our startup of the week there was in one interesting piece that you put in about john stewart plunging the knife into apple what, what, what's john stewart been doing he's always been a big fan of tech uh, is his is his pessimism now about tech does that reflect a broader pessimism about tech in america I don't really know what he really thinks about tech, but he interviewed Lena Khan this week, which was apparently <laughs> apparently Apple wouldn't let him interview her. So Apple has the same taste as me, it seems. Uh, so he left and he brought her on to The Daily Show to interview her. And I do suspect he is part of the generation that looks at social media. I mean, he has a self-interest, right? He's an old media success story and he has not been a new media success story so for him social media is uh, is probably a, a a competitor if you will although i i do note that he's been putting his daily show monologues on youtube recently and, and i for one have been watching them so um maybe he's learning um anyway i i you know he stuck the knife into apple by outing them for limiting his editorial um capabilities on the show that Apple was paying for. I mean, it sounds like the same fight that between your firm and, and I don't want to have an Elon Musk conversation. He's fortunately not in the newsletter this week. Elon Musk and Don Lemon. Uh, yep. I mean, the, the people who pay for these shows have every right to cancel it if they don't want it, whether it's Musk, X or Apple, don't they? They have the right, but you can draw your own conclusions about their 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 um their custodial power is being wielded to prevent conversation that they don't approve of normally a libertarian would say that's not okay well i think we should be honest keith and acknowledge that the this show is brought to you by the chinese communist party and the chinese <laughs> government and exactly. they're paying us large amounts of money for keith to trash america and suggest that we should all go and live in beijing which i am not going to do but i think maybe keith next show you'll be in beijing i'll be in maybe, maybe shanghai andrew or shanghai well that all sounds the same to me anyway finally keith 
we've done X of the week. That was Mike Maple and his excitement. Not We're not calling it a bubble over AI, but it's an interesting startup of the week. I never heard of it. Uh, not this one. It's called Rubric, and it's not Rubric's Cube. It's the Rubric IPO. Tell us why you've given this uh, this award, your startup of the week award to Rubric. What's significant about it? It, it's um, it's because it's the second IPO in, in, in recent weeks. The other one was uh, Reddit. Reddit, by the way, is shocking to me. Its share price has gone quite up since it IPO'd. Rubrik is a more standard enterprise company in the security space. Uh, and it's, it's far incredibly from- boring, but clearly yeah. you're seeing it as symbolic. You're less interested in its IPA and more what it tells us about the economy. Yeah, and and about IPOs in general, and the optimism in, in Silicon Valley will go quite a lot further up if that IPO is successful, and I think it will be, from what I read about it. So there's reasons to be cheerful, Keith. Even in America, even if it can't be China, still the IPO market is back, and uh, we should be cheerful in the spring of 2024. Always look on the bright side of life, is the song, isn't it? Even for Spurs fans? Even for Spurs fans, because it could be a lot worse.